Good morning, everybody. This morning, we're going to begin our approach to Easter. When some thought, maybe we'll get into Lazarus today, but not yet. When we finish Easter, the day, the Sunday after Easter, we'll get back to Lazarus, who is the seventh sign of knowing that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. But today, we're going to Matthew 27. Now, I'm going to apologize right now because I got a cup of water with me. I caught a cold this weekend, and I might cough, and I want to try to calm that chance of coughing with a cup of water because this mic would be really loud if I coughed right now, wouldn't it? (laughs) That might be a little harsh on all of us, but... uh, We want to look at this uh, Matthew 27. We're going to look today at the trial. And actually, we're going to look at the question that's on the screen already. What will you do with Christ? Uh, That's similar to the question that uh, Pilate asked the crowd when he was presenting maybe Barabbas, maybe Jesus. Which would it be? What will you do with Christ? We're going to look at uh, odd thing this morning. What will you do with Christ? Let's look at the passage of Scripture. First of all, Matthew 27. We'll start with verse 15. And we'll read a few verses here in this trial before Pilate with Jesus. Verse 15. At the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who is it you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Messiah? For he knew they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for today I have suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priests and elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. The governor asked them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, What should I do then with Jesus, who is called Messiah? They all answered, Crucify him. Hindsight wise today, we would say, I'm glad he was crucified. But we say that reluctantly, don't we? Because we know that it is because of our guilt and our shame, our sin itself is the reason why Jesus was crucified. We would reluctantly say, let him be crucified. Four reasons I want to give you this morning that tell us why we might say, even if it is reluctant, let him be crucified. First of all, It's God's calendar of events. God's timeline. What are we talking about at all? It was God's timeline that God said to Abraham, I make a covenant with you. I make a covenant with you that your offspring will be so numerous that even though you might try to count the stars in the sky, you will never be able to accomplish what I will do for you. God's timeline. God's timeline sent Jacob, also called Israel, and his children and family all to Goshen, a part of Egypt, to protect them from the famine that had come. Why? Because Joseph, in God's timeline, had sent him there, and he became a leader in Egypt that also put away grain that protected them in the famine that was coming. And now Jacob arrives with his family from that famine. 430 years later, God's timeline said, Moses, go bring my people out. God's timeline. God's timeline also said to Joshua, it's time for you now, after these 40 years of rebellion by the Israelites, to take them into the land that I promised them, Canaan. And they went in. They conquered it and occupied it. God's timeline. God's timeline said to a king, God's going to give you a sign that he will bring you victory. 
And it is a maiden who will give birth to a child. The prophecy of Jesus Christ. God's timeline said, It's now time, Mary. You will become expecting a child by the Holy Spirit. God's timeline. God's timeline also said, Pilate asked these people who they will release. Who will they crucify? We want Barabbas, a notorious criminal. We want him released instead of this man who healed, touched, brought us words of wisdom, lived a good life. Give us a notorious criminal instead. God's timeline. You know, when we think about God's timeline sometimes, we say, God, aren't you off? Didn't you make a mistake? Weren't you a little late? Weren't you late? It, it, this Calvary was not an accident. It's an absolute climax of history. Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, verse 8. Now listen carefully to what this says. All those who live on the earth will worship Him. You recognize that? All those who live on the earth will worship Him. Everyone whose name was not written in the book of the life of the Lamb. Everyone, even those who do not believe in Jesus, will not accept God into their lives. Even they will come to a point in life where they will worship Him. Because the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. In eternity... Jesus was slain. Then there came a timeline, God's calendar of events, when Jesus went to the cross. Climax of history. Yes, from the Garden of Eden, when God said, the woman will give birth, and the seed of the woman will bruise the head of Satan. Satan's been bruised. He still has power to tempt you. He doesn't have the power. He does not have the power to make you sin. You choose to sin. That's the reason why the sin, guilt, is on you not, and on me. But the power of Satan is limited. It is limited. Throughout the Israelite history, we've seen these things. The sacrifices of lambs for their sin was a foreshadow of Jesus Christ Himself coming and dying on the cross. And all of that pointed to that cross until the time of Calvary itself. The second reason why we reluctantly say, let Him be crucified, is the man on the cross next to Christ. You remember that story? It was so, so unusual Three died on crosses that day, and Jesus in the middle of two. One joined the crowd to mock Jesus, ridicule him. You who said you could do such and such and do so many things, and he became a part of that mockery. The other one, he knew. He said, we deserve what we're getting. We deserve to die here. This man's not done anything wrong. Nothing. Jesus. Will you remember me? Today, you will be in paradise with me. Second reason, the man on the cross. Let me ask you a question that kind of brings it back to that question Pilate asked that crowd. Who do you want me to release? What if they said, release to us Jesus. Let Barabbas be crucified. Where would that man on the other cross be today? Where would he be? Thief would still be lost, and you would have no salvation. Neither would I. God's timeline. Man on the cross. Two reasons. A third reason is the sins of the whole world. Just kind of picture yourself for a moment like you could fly over all of the world. Maybe it's just... Better if we just say, how about just flying over smack over? All those homes down there that you see, people living in those homes, they need Jesus, do they not? That lady in her backyard working in her garden, that man on his horse, those boys and girls at school, 
those youth watching that basketball game, all of them need Jesus. All of them. And they include me as well. Remember that in each of those homes there's a need. But how in the world do we know today that the world deals with sin? Some of them just ignore it. Yeah, we're all like that, so who cares? You know? Some others blame others. Pass the buck to somebody else. Well, you know, it was, it was my heritage. You know, I can't help it. What my great-grandfather did, and what my grandfather did, and what my father did, and here I am inheriting all of this. This is just the way it is. Some say, it's my environment. You know, with all my surrounding, it, it's just the way it is, you know. I, I can't change that, so that's the way it is. And it's, <sighs> Others blame fate. I just fell into this situation in my life, and that can't be changed. That's the way it is. And so what? So some blame others. Some pass the buck. Some try to atone for their sins for, by themselves, on their own. You know, God cannot ignore all the good that I do. Hmm. Surely He wouldn't just turn a blind eye to what I'd marvelously do for this world that I live in. Just ask even my neighbors. I'm a good guy. Mm -hmm. You know, God can't ignore all the money I've given away. He just, he just knows. God cannot ignore that I was born into a Christian family. Isn't that enough? And he can't ignore the fact that I'm a member of a church. Doesn't that make it the way it is? No. No. You see, some have decided, and I'm one of them, that God's way is the way I want to go. That I've accepted God's way of dealing with sin. You know, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Hebrews 9.22 According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Doesn't matter how much money you've given, doesn't matter what church you belong to, doesn't matter if your mom and dad were Christians, doesn't matter if you're a good man in the community, if you have not accepted the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross for your payment of sins, you're still lost. It's marvelous when we're good people. It's marvelous when we can give to help others. It's marvelous that we have a, a membership in the church. And it's marvelous that we had moms and dads that were Christian as well. But if we've never accepted the shed blood of Jesus Christ, it will make no difference to God in your salvation. Are you ready? Some accept God's way. You know, anything that strips the atonement of the cross is heresy. Did I say that right? Let me say it again just in case. Anything that takes away the atonement of the cross for your salvation and my salvation is heresy. You want to come to God in any other way? He will not receive you. Jesus said, there will be those that I'll say to, I never knew you. When you remove the cross from the gospel, you destroy salvation. So we have God's timeline. We have the man on the cross. We have the sins of the whole world. There's three good reasons why we reluctantly say, let him be crucified. What's the fourth one? Jesus' own actions, his very own action. He demonstrated his power in this world. You know, he fed the multitudes with so little bread, did that twice. One with 5,000 men counted, and one was with 4,000 men counted. 
and there were others there as well, women and children. Now wholeness returned to lives who were touched by him. Blind could see, the lame could walk. There was sickness that was healed. And there was three times Jesus brought a person back to life from death. One of them was Jairus' little daughter. Can you imagine your little 12-year-old dying? He brought back a widow's son. She was going to be lost. But in that city of Nain, they saw Jesus bring that boy back to life in the midst of their funeral for him. And then there's Lazarus. Funeral was over. He was buried. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come out of there. And he did. Jesus' own actions. This demonstration of his power to be the Son of God, the Messiah. The identification of himself. But more importantly than his demonstration of physical abilities, his transformation of spiritual lives. Just by his teaching. One day, he said to his disciples, Who do men say that I am? Oh, they think you're Elijah, come back to life. Oh, they think you're that great prophet. You know, they just think this is, you're that wonderful person. They've been expecting to come. And Jesus then said, But who do you say I am? We know what Peter said. I mean, he spoke up quickly. You are the Christ. You are the Christ. But I ask you the same question that Jesus would ask of me. Who do you say that I am? Oh, that good man that we ought to follow the think teachings that he gave us? Or is he the Son of God who died for your sins, the Lamb that's brought to, into this world to be slain for the sins of the world? Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say? Jesus' own actions. The power that held Jesus to the cross. We think, well, it might have been those soldiers or the authority of those, those uh, Jewish leadership. It may have been those nails. And you know, we sing a song about what did not happen. He could have called 10,000 angels. You know the song. He didn't. He didn't. They were flogging his back. He didn't call the angels to protect him from the pain. They put the thorns on his brow. He didn't call the angels to protect him from the pain. They nailed his hands and his feet, and he didn't call on the angels. He hung there till he died, and he didn't call on the angels. That's our Jesus. You see, he could have obliterated his foes instead of being nailed. He could have been crowned with diamonds instead of with thorns. Jesus could have been clothed with royal garments instead of being stripped. Instead, he stayed on the cross. But well, what was the power that kept him on the cross? Love. You want to know how much Jesus loves you? He loves you this much. That's what kept him on the cross. But is that all of it? If Jesus must be crucified, the scripture makes it very clear, I must also be crucified. If anyone come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Those are the very words of Jesus himself. Take up the cross. Take up the cross. Galatians 2, 19 and 20, written by Paul from God's own heart, says this to us. For through the law I have died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
You see, today, we understand that Jesus died that we might be saved. And I must die so that we can live. But what does it mean to be crucified? Years ago, we would have heard this. I don't hear it anymore. Maybe because we've come to a greater understanding. But I've heard this before. Oh, I've got my cross to bear. 